Today, there are over 10,000 miles of high-speed rail around the world and about a billion annual passengers. China, in particular, is a leader. They've built 4,000 miles of high-speed rail and they're building another 2,500. Um, so U.S. really pales in comparison when you look around the world to these examples. All this international experience has shown that high-speed rail can produce real benefits. You have economies that function more productively because you can move knowledge workers from their businesses from city center to city center. And that uh, raises incomes, raises productivity, contributing to uh, greater specialization and more competitive regions. High-speed rail works in very specific circumstances. It's primarily the trip lengths of 100 to 600 miles in length. So it's a little long to drive, but it's a little too short to fly. And corridors of, the, of that length are usually found in America's mega regions. There are 11 mega regions around the country in which 70% of the U.S. population and 70% of the U.S. jobs are concentrated. So high-speed rail really provides um, the, the connecting force that make those mega regions more productive and more connected to each other. How do we fund it? The funding question for high-speed rail is not so different than the tricky funding challenge for our nation's surface transportation as a whole. The problem is we don't have enough money to pay for our existing roads and transit, but Congress needs to address that. They can do it by raising the gas tax, uh, they could look at going to an upstream oil tax, a VMT charge, so there are a range of options. Really the important thing is that we dedicate a certain amount of funding, whether it be pennies on the gas tax or percent to high-speed rail. And that provides the continuity and reliability of funding over time. 